Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. More saving, more doing. On this week's podcast, we'll share with you some things that are pretty pertinent to this time of the year, a few spring cleaning tips. And Joe shares with us an idea on a a product that he found out about that uh, you just won't expect. Yeah, it's for cleaning windows. It is pretty it's a pretty funny looking product, and, it, it, <laughs> it and I think it will. I haven't tried it, but it's just, it's a great idea. You, you'll have to stay tuned to hear yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> and we also talked to a homeowner who's building a patio using paving stones, and he has a question about the proper base material to use. That is extremely important because if you don't have a good foundation underneath the pavers, they're never going to stay flat. So we're going to give him some really good options. Hey, you know what? The dishwasher is one of those, another one of those mysterious little appliances in the kitchen is certainly one that everybody loves to have and uh, when it's working well it is great but when it starts flooding the kitchen uh, it's not a very friendly appliance and we'll uh, share with the listener a number of things that you need to look at to make sure your drainage in your dishwasher goes where it needs to go. And I've got a simple solution how to eliminate stale musty odors from inside your house using a dryer sheet. Hey we're going to cover all of these things and a whole lot more so let's get started with this podcast. Right now, we're going to Texas. Jimmy's on the phone with a pretty interesting question. Jimmy, welcome to the show. Hi, how you guys doing today? Hey, man, we're doing great. Great, thanks. We're doing great. You got a little project in mind trying to figure out if it's going to work. Tell us about it. Yes, sir. I, I have uh, probably one of the worst backyards you could ever have anywhere, and I'm um, trying to do things slowly, little by little, and we just installed a 17 by 20 foot gable style patio cover, but my yard does not reflect how nice the patio cover is, so we're on a tight budget like most families are, so I'm trying to figure out what I could do with the hardscape. Okay. And in the interim, before we could do something like pavers that we would really like to do, I was looking into the um, the base stuff like uh, your Black Star gravel and things like that because I've seen a lot of a lot of homeowners use that, and I, I kind of like it, and it doesn't seem very expensive. But I don't know what type of rock to go with that would be more conducive for our family, whether it's a crushed granite, a, a whitewashed limestone, or, you know, the black star gravel. So I was looking for some, some opinions on that. Okay. All right. Well, we certainly have used it for a lot of different scenarios. And um, one of the videos that you may have seen, I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but we actually created a really cool walkway and patio in one of our past episodes of our uh, television show. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, it worked. It really worked great. And what you're looking for is a crushed stone. And that stone might be marble, might be granite, might be just uh, recycled concrete. And I, and I found out by doing that show in the particular, uh, we were doing uh, taping the show in the southeast, and the, uh, the crushed stone was more of a limestone base and very gray in color. We did another similar project out in um, really the west part of Texas, and the same material was a very kind of a red-orange color. Still the same properties and pack now, but it just kind of surprised us a little bit on the differences throughout the country with the different paver base. But if, if you if you decide to do that, of course, you're going to have to remove all of the grass under it, and you know, you're know you really going to have to focus on it being um, either perfectly level or or um, angled or sloped in such a way to control your water that uh, will come off of that, even though a lot of it will be absorbed in the pavers, which is one of the advantages, how it soaks down through it. But um, but if but if you're looking at the pavers later on, you just want to make sure that you're lowering the grade and, you know, packing it out, get get one of the, um, the, the, the compactors and run over it really well, and then put, um, and you can go, if it, you know, if you're not driving a car on it, anything like that, two to three inches, you'll be perfectly fine. You can put that down, you can grade it off, you can pack it down again with the compactor that you have, and it is one heck of a hard surface. Now, Barefoot, nah, not so much. You might have a little problem with a rough, a little too rough for that. But for any other use, um, it works pretty well. And as we do a lot of times in kind of phased remodeling, you're set up then at any time you want to do some pavers, you're ready to go with it right after that. Yes, sir. So is there like, I have a three-year-old and I, I two things I'd like to avoid is one, 
being able to pick up a lot of rocks, obviously, I know some are more rock based than the other and some are more crushed than the other. And two, every time the wind blows or we get a category three hurricane coming in down here in Houston, you know, I don't want it all to blow away. So is there a, a certain type of, of brand or like, like I said, the black star compared to the limestone that I should kind of go with or look into one being you know better than the other for these properties? Uh, I'll tell you, um, everyone I've ever used, uh, most of what we've used is from our um, our friends at Pavestone, mm-hmm. which is located there just outside Dallas. Of course, it's a nationwide company, but um, they, they seem to have a very consistent um, uh, size, the size of the uh, crushed stone all seems to be very, very consistent, and that makes it much, much easier to pack. But, um, Joe, uh, w- what do you think about some kind of polymer sand that after this is all down, maybe lightly, lightly putting some sand there that might lock everything together? What do you think? Yeah, Jimmy, so you're thinking of putting down crushed stone and then going over with pavers or not going over it with pavers? Well, down the road, budgetary-wise, it might be a year or two. And so we might have to dig it back up, and I'm okay with that because the cost of this stuff from some of these landscaping yards is not too bad. Right. So for now, I want to use it just as a hardscape to kind of get by. Yeah. So we're going to put down maybe some flagstone just for a couple steps here and there, but for the most part, it was going to be the base as the overall hardscape. Okay. Um, that I'm not sure how it would work out for the reasons you explained. First of all, a three-year-old is going to be picking those stones out no matter what you try to tell him or her not to do. Right. Um, I, I would, you know, I would put down, if you're going to put down, um, crushed stone, um, and then compact it, you know, I, I would just, I would just bite the bullet and put down the pavers. If you're not, if you just can't do it and you want to put, because I'm not sure how that base is going to survive without the pavers on top of it. You're going to have rain on top of it and people walking. Uh, you know, it's not going to, ordinarily, if you put down a paver base and you compact it, and by the way, if you're putting down more than uh, two inches, which I would highly recommend, put down two two or three inches, compact it, put down another inch or two, compact it. Because if you try to compact three or four inches, it never, the bi- base layers never really compact very well. So do it in layers. And you can rent the plate compactor, gas power play compactor pretty affordably but you know i I just not sure if you put down a compacted base um for a patio for paver stones and then you don't put anything over i'm not sure how it would survive you know it's because it needs the protection of something on top of it um i mean you could do it inexpensive even like that black star uh that black star gravel yeah i was gonna say you could just put a inexpensive wood deck over it you know for lack of a better word um just to cover it and protect it until you're ready but yeah i'm not i'm not familiar with you're saying black star what is that exactly that's a local stone yeah it's a it's a i got a i got a friend who's used it on a project before and he said he liked the black star gravel it's, it's like a, it's just uh like a base i guess when i say base it might be my terminology not necessarily a base for pavers but kind of like they did on the video that that he was referring to i watched they put down the, the base and put some i think some stones i, I can't remember just for walking, like people do the base flagstone thing. Right, yeah, just like flagstones or pavers. Yeah, yeah but we're, we're not going to cover every square inch. Just like maybe a few stones for walking and the, the rest surrounding was going to be the crushed gravel. Right. I was just trying to get an idea if there was one better than the other that, that compacted a little bit more. That would withstand the, the environment a little bit better than some of the other ones. Well, there's certainly um, a big difference in uh, some of the paving material, but most of it that we've gotten in the bags are very, very consistent, like the ones we get from Pavestone. So I would check that out and maybe just uh, take a couple bags and try it out there. You'll see how it compacts pretty well. But thanks so much for uh, being with us here on the show and hope that solves the problem and might uh, inspire some others with some ideas on things they can do in their backyard. All right. Well, let's see if we can help Christy, who's in uh, Montana, with uh, a few ideas here. Christy, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. Of course. What can we help you with? You've got a got a um, question here about uh, some chimney options. I do. You bet. So, you know, I own a 1962 Rancher. Great home. I've owned it for about 15 years now. It's solid, solidly built. It's beautiful home. Thank, thanks for the photos, Christy. It's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I do my little updating here and there. I replace windows, of course. Yeah. And so, you know, little, little projects Good. here and there. Now, um, with my chimney... I've got a colonial mat Norman brick, and it's flaking at the top. And so, you know, big chunks of brick are not falling off, but more so like thin little slabs, if you will. You know, just little thin, 
you know, pieces of brick come raining down on my uh, front sidewalk there. And I think that the, you know, with a home of my age, you know, that weathering on the top is uh, causing the bricks just right up there on the top in the first four to five rows to, you know, slightly, they're, slight, they're just getting old, like we all are. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. I'm flaking off myself a little bit here and there. I'm flaking myself a little bit, too. Um I found the same exact brick. Right. But the brick that I found, of course, is a much deeper red. Yeah, it's going to, it's going to be a variation of that. That's always a challenge anytime you, you have a brick um, going into it like that. Now, is this, um, when you look around, of course, I'm looking at the pictures. When you're looking around the top part of the chimney, is uh, so it's just the very top part of it. There's no, no other areas around. Correct. Okay. Correct. And I, I do have a problem with that. Uh, oh, I... I don't know what it's called. The cement. Right. Just the uh, cap on it. Right. That cap has mm-hmm. cracked also. Sure. Yeah. It normally does with something like that. Well, here's here's an idea that just popped into my head is that if you were um, to remove, um, you know, just um, have someone uh, go up and remove um, any of the loose pieces in the top, say, two courses of that brick. And then um, I know in your email to us, you mentioned that you didn't particularly like stucco and to do the entire thing with stucco probably would be a little stark and a little expensive. But if you were to do only the top 10 inches, let's say the top two courses and the um, concrete um, cap, and if you were to have stucco run around there in a nice, neat little band, and then at the same time, you can coat the top of the concrete cap uh, because of the cracks and the waterproofing that is needed there, um, then you have a nice little accent band, and I'm not sure painting it the red burgundy type color you have on your trim and putting that up there, if it wouldn't just disappear and look like it's been there for, um, for a long, long time. And this would be very inexpensive. Expensive. If you can find the right guy, the right mason, a little handyman guy to take care of this, might be a good way to go without spending a lot of money, and it'll tighten everything up to where the problem doesn't continue. Yeah, I mean, here's my question. Okay, I know masons, um, you know, they're uh, in our region. Their fees are right at 100 an hour, so... Um, I know that this wouldn't be that much money. More so, I'm worried a little about the weather. We get the hots and the colds. We have real extremes here. I'm a little nervous about stucco and its durability with our extreme swings. Yeah, Chrissy, that's the reason that you're having the problem at the top because water is coming off of that capstone, soaking into those top two or three courses, freezing, expanding, and that's why you're having that flaking. Okay, but how will stucco hold up? Well, you'll be able, once you get the stucco on there, it'll basically seal everything um, up to where you're not getting that penetration. That's where you would need to look to have them do the top part of it and so forth to allow um, the water to completely um, you know, not be allowed to soak into that. Because like Joe said, especially with the cold weather, water's getting in, you're having to freeze, and it's just kind of popping all of the faces off of that right at the very top. But the stucco, I think, will provide a nice cosmetic effect and a nice finish to it, but also prevent any of that water from getting in there that's causing the problems that you have. So hopefully that will guide you along, Christy. Thank you so much for your call from Montana. It's time for our best new product segment brought to you by the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. You know, the beauty of a ratchet is that it allows you to turn a nut or bolt in real close quarters without removing and resetting the tool constantly. But some spaces are so tight that you can only move the ratchet just a few degrees at a time. And that's where the Husky 12-volt lithium-ion cordless ratchet is a big advantage. The 12-volt lithium-ion battery inside this tool turns it at up to 230 RPM RPMs and can produce up to 30 pounds of torque. So that's um that's pretty interesting to be able to um, just use that tool in such close quarters because the low profile head and built-in LED lights make seeing and working in tight areas even easier. There's a variable speed lever for real precise control, and if more torque is required, you can use it as a manual ratchet where it can handle up to 150 pounds of torque. It charges in just one hour and a half and lasts up to 240 fastening cycles per charge. So for more information on this Husky 12-volt lithium-ion cordless ratchet, log on to Home Depot. 
Com. I can think of a dozen times that I have needed that. My, my, my knuckles, uh, anytime I do anything to do with that, everybody probably the same way. I feel like I end up with Band-Aids all over my knuckles, so uh, not no fun at all. So. We were talking about uh, window cleaning last week. Actually, yeah. for the last two weeks, window cleaning. And, of course, the spring cleaning time, people are getting out and opening up their drapes and realizing they don't quite see out the window because there's so much dirt and dust on the outside. And um, I ran across, um, I saw this product online. I thought I'd share it with you, Danny, and our listeners. It's called Easy Cleaner. Um, and I suppose you go to easycleaner.com, you can see a video of this thing. And it's essentially, it's a magnetic window cleaner. And I don't know how well it works. It looks really cool on the video. And it was just a great idea. It's essentially two window cleaning pads that are about the size of like a blackboard eraser. And they're tethered together with a string. And they have magnetic faces and covered with felt or some kind of cleaning surface. And the idea is you put one on the outside of your window, you reach around, you put it on the outside, then you put the other one on the inside and they stick together because <laughs> really? they're magnet, right? <laughs> and then as you move the interior one back and forth, the one on the outside cleans the outside of the window at the same time. Wow. I mean, that is a great idea. Now, again, I've not tried it, so I don't know if it really works, but we should test it out. Yeah, test that out. Of course, if it's, uh, you know, if you have uh, individually divided panes, uh, that's not going to work very well. But, right, you know, if a, grills you know, on the outside, you know, a single right? pane window that's just just uh, one piece of glass or even a double pane that's smooth yeah. like that, I could see, I could see where it works. Now, um, you know, and it's kind of funny because we talk about um, in a lot of the spring cleaning tips, especially cleaning windows, first of all, any task that you do is a little bit easier and more pleasant if you have someone to share the misery with you. So if you if you, <laughs> exactly. if you have someone else when they're cleaning windows, one on the inside and one on the outside, cleaning the exact window, then you won't have, you, you don't, you, you'll know if the smudge that you're, you're trying to clean off is on the inside or outside. You can get it. And again, it makes it a little, a little more fun just to go along. And <clears throat> window cleaning is something people always dread, but it's right. really not that bad. It goes pretty uh, quickly, know, really. Unless yeah. you have to, you know, climb a ladder a lot and things like that. But anyway, that's that's one of those uh, kind of techniques. And of course, we've also mentioned how how well um, a 50-50, um, well, I'm not sure it's 50-50, a uh, mixture of vinegar, white vinegar and water um, yeah, 50, I, think, I don't know if it needs to be 50 50. No, it's I would less say than that. Yeah. 25, yeah. 75. Yeah. So, 50, 25 so, vinegar. Right? Yeah, so about one part vinegar, three parts water. Anyway, right. that works uh, very well, very inexpensive to. Um, you know, to clean the windows like that, that works pretty well. But but when you, when you talked about a magnetic thing like that, that right, wasn't there some type of simple solution that you had a while back that was similar to that? Something about cleaning a vase or something like that. Does that ring a bell? Uh, not with a magnet. Was it a um, magnet like a, or something yeah. else? No, I'm trying to think what I use magnets for. No, it did, yeah. did remind me, though, Danny, of another simple solution uh-huh. that I hadn't talked about recently where if you can't reach a window easily from the outside of your house rather than getting a ladder because it's, you know, it's either up too high on the first floor or obviously the second floor, is you get a PVC pipe and the it's the inside diameter. I think it's... I think it's a one and a half inch PVC pipe. I don't remember exactly. They come in 10 foot length, so they're pretty Uh long. And the handle of most squeegees, window squeegees, fit right inside it. Uh And Uh so you can reach up, you know, it has the sponge on one side of the squeegee and the rubber squeegee part on the other. And so you can scrub it and, you know, safely from the ground. I think I'd put a bolt through it. And the other thing, you were talking about having spring cleaning, having someone to share it with. Well, we decided to go through our dressers and our wardrobe closets just to cull out some of the clothes. Um, that wasn't exactly my idea, but uh, I, was par- <laughs> yeah. I was participating nonetheless. He was kicking and screaming is what he's yes. trying to say. Yeah. And I realized I hadn't changed my underwear in six months. Whoa. Now, Whoa. now I need to explain this a little. Whoa. Is that, yeah, you know, we do laundry like most people, I guess, once a week. So I, you know, every five or six days we do laundry and I take the five or six pair of underwear I wore that week and I put them in the front of the drawer and I use them. And then next week, I do, and I realized in the back of my drawer, there's a whole bunch of really nice clean underwear. I don't remember <laughs> when I bought it. It's been in hiding. So the the tip is to rotate the stock, as rotate we used to say. Rotate the stock. Wow. When I, was in, when I was in high school, I had a job in a supermarket and they say, rotate the stock, bring the, <laughs> the old cans forward and put the new cans in the back. And now I understand. Oh, man, that. I so, don't even know what to say so, now. <laughs> so, yeah, you, you think it's funny. When you get home, you're going to say, you know what? Joe's right. Oh, man. I do have clean underwear in the back, yes, brand boy. new underwear. So, oh, I'm a, so I will. Go. I'll definitely be thinking about it. I'll tell you that. <laughs> 
<laughs> All works right. with socks, too, by the way. Well, that just goes to show you, you're really not sure what you'll hear when you tune into today's Home Auto. We, we, we're talking about everything to do with the house, <laughs> right. everything in the house, and remember, rotate the stock. That's an important one there. You know, people talk about flipping mattresses over, right. and, and I yep. can really see the wisdom in that. You know, flip them over just so that you don't have the same impressions and that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, that's something that suggested that you do once a year. Now, of course, the mattress manufacturers would just assume <laughs> you course. buy a new one every year. Um, I, right. I'm just amazed at how many, like, mattress factories and mat- mattress outlets where I, I don't understand. I mean, I have several beds in my house because of the different bedrooms, but I really not. I don't look to buy a new mattress very often. There must be a huge markup because everybody is selling beds. Yeah. Right. Every com- companies that aren't even really into furniture are selling beds. Every furniture store. Then, of course, there are just bed companies that sell just beds yeah i, I don't quite get well, it well, like I, I said it must be a huge market i pulled up to a, a gas station the other day and they had mattresses stacked up on one side of the uh, parking lot and they had mulch over on the other <laughs> side so you get <laughs> you get you a few bags of mulch you get you a mattress everything i, I was kidding about the mattress part but uh but yeah. you know uh but but the mulch it's amazing i mean anywhere any of these you know these uh these filling stations these gas stations will have just these big giant pallets you know two dollars a piece and and that's the same kind of thing you see in up your way during the start of winter you have all of the rock salt piled up on these pallets right. everywhere that and firewood and firewood you see yeah, little certainly. packets of firewood i mean fortunately where i live there are trees everywhere and they're, they come down every year so i cut them up we've been in the house 25 years of a wood-burning fireplace i haven't bought a stick of firewood yet yeah I, I, i'm not sure i've ever uh, and buying the little what you should buy like four pieces for five bucks or whatever uh, we, we we did <laughs> that 10 a, minutes we did that a couple times on a, on a television uh shoot we were doing and everything and i i still couldn't get over that that's like buying pine straw now for five dollars a bale when as a kid i raked and burned at least a million dollars worth of pine right. straw if, if only you'd known if only i'd have known pine straw king i would be the i would alabama that would exactly what it would be all right well let's get back to home improvement right now Lindsay has a question she joins us from kansas Lindsay, welcome to the today's home already Show. Hi. What can we do for you? So my husband and I just bought our first house and Congratulations. We thank you. We um had a kitchen flood. <laughs> it was not fun. Oh. Um our dishwasher was broken when we moved in and the homeowner the homeowner's warranty or whatever that the previous owners gave us is going to send us a new dishwasher. However, wow, good. The problem I don't think is I'm not sure if it's with the dishwasher or not because it's when I run the sink, the water drains through the piping directly into the dishwasher, and the dishwasher is then flooding out. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually a pretty common problem, Lindsay. And, and if you can peek up inside that cabinet, you'll see a drain line going from the sink to the dishwasher, and that should be looped up as high as possible. It's often actually attached to the underside of the countertop. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> it's definitely not. There you go. I think I think we may have found the problem. It could be a couple other things, but that's typically the first thing to check. That it has to have a, as tall a loop as you can have, go up as high as it can. And what it, it does, obviously, is when water drains out of the starts to drain out of the sink, it can't go uphill, right? So it's going to come back into the sink and go through the sink drain. Right. Now, obviously, you have to make sure that the sink drain lines are working. They're not clogged, or the dishwasher isn't clogged. But assuming that. The, drain, the sink is draining properly so that it isn't just backing up, in which it would eventually, even if you had a that tall loop, I guess sooner or later water would push it up and flow over. So that, that that's what you need to do. And if it if it doesn't have one of those, there's a device called an air gap that they use instead. But I, I, I suspect it's just that this loop is not held up high inside that cabinet. Yeah, the loop is actual cord or pipe, I guess, whatever, is right. um, hose. connected to, like, the top part of the sink, and it goes straight, straight down, and it's really tight. It, it, should I be buying a, a longer hose? Well, it's tight in that it doesn't seem like it's it's, it's you need a longer hose. Lo- I mean, you could certainly replace it with a longer hose. I'm not sure why. They're usually okay. pretty standard length, and I usually have to cut them because they're a little too long. But, I mean, unless your sink is a great distance or longer distance than normal. Um, You know, they're usually long enough, but in any case, yeah, you could replace it. And it, when it loops up, it should be a really smooth U shaped loop. It shouldn't be like an upside down V, right? You don't want to, 
tight V. So, so um, okay. And you know, you want to make sure it's attached so that the water could flow. Connect it to the underside of the the countertop. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank it makes you. it a little more challenging if you have a granite countertop, but there's a way to do that. Use epoxy, stick a wood block up there, then screw on a little bracket to hold the pipe. There are a couple of different ways to do it. Okay. Well, well Lindsay, uh, uh, again, congratulations on your brand new home. Nothing like it. It's a great feeling. And don't let any of the, you know, any of the tasks that you may face, uh, you know, overwhelm you. Uh, we're always glad to help you with them. And just um, a little task at a time, you'll, you'll have the best looking house around. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, you take care. Thank you. Good luck. Oh, that's good. I mean, it's always exciting. I can remember my very first house and uh, the excitement around that, and I I wanted to tinker on it just about the whole time. And uh, I still uh, tinkering. Yeah, I oh, love yeah. it. Never never get finished with that. We're gonna try to help Pam right now, who's in North Carolina. Pam, welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you. Tell us all about this porch. Now you got a little frustrating situation with it. You did send us a picture here. It looks like you have a a little uh, a lake on your front porch. Uh, <laughs> tell us about that. Yes. Yes. Well, it started out with just the the bottom portion. When my husband poured it, he did not level it. It was, you know, he just poured it out there. Then a couple of years later, we added the top. And I wanted something a little different that nobody else had around here, so I put the lattice work on the front, up top there. Right. Yeah, I see that. That's very lovely. Yep. Thank you. I used to think that maybe the rain was coming in through that way. Well, I don't think so because it either comes in from the step side, which is the picture that you all got, or the other side. And I don't know. I don't understand it. I thought, you know, I put the porch, the cover, the top on it. And it still gets wet. Well, a lot of times what might happen is that water sheeting down off of the roof, and then you get just a little bit of wind. Doesn't take much, you know, in order to um, blow it onto the corner of the porch, and then it just kind of fills up the low area there. So not uncommon from that situation. And uh, certainly, uh, you know, if you have gutters along there, that may help a little bit. But still, uh, the walls are, you know, seven or eight foot tall. You're going to have water blowing in there at some point or the other. But certainly the key thing here is to have that concrete to where it's sloped enough that that water runs off immediately because standing water in any area will create some deterioration even on a concrete porch like this. So um, the thing that uh, really needs to be done is some um, kind of resurfacing of the patio uh, of the porch so that it does have the water sloping straight off of there. And I would think with this space, looks like it's around 10 foot or so, that I would have at least three quarters of an inch um, slope to the outside. So um, uh, it's uh, not a tremendously hard project. You can use something like the a resurfacer from um, Quickrete is one that we've used a lot. Uh, it's called Recap. Recap. And you can um, you, you you actually want it slightly damp when you apply, but you can go and look um, at quickrete.com and see one of their videos. And we've used it a lot, especially there's so many patios that just have cracks and problems with them, or or they've been poured at different times, and you we, you know you, you just resurface the whole thing and really make it look good. So you can do that, and and that will solve the problem. You just need to slope it properly, and the water will you know, blow in there and it'll pour right off. Now, also, you can put a resurfacer material down, allow it to dry, and then put a floor on top of that, like a, a porcelain ceramic. A lot more expensive, but certainly more attractive. But either way, that should work really well in order to satisfy that problem. Well, I am so happy to hear that because I have seen you use some things like that on your show. Uh -huh. And I would say something to my husband about that. <laughs> And he would go, oh, well, they're just using it in cracks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, that's what uh, that's what's used a lot. But you'll be surprised, Pam, how often this kind of scenario happens. Whether it's from original construction, original pouring of the slab, or uh, a little settling here and there. But uh, no, just just check it out because what you'll normally do with something like that is you would apply one coat of it that just kind of maybe maybe you're up about um, half inch on one side down to nothing, 
uh-huh. and then allow it to dry and then apply another coat of it. And you can put it on with a, a large rubber squeegee that really is uh-huh. a lot easier than you might think. Uh-huh. And you just have to eyeball it so that you're getting it nice and level and you finish it up. And I would suggest r- rubbing a broom over it right. so that you get a little bit of traction on it and so forth. But uh, that'll solve the problem. And then rain or shine, you can enjoy it out there without getting your feet wet. That'd be great. Now, can I ask you one more question? As sure. far as gutters, I do not have any, and uh-huh. I have got um, the vinyl stuff around the top of it, you know. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, uh-huh. My husband says that it'll still rot the wood because he thinks that gutters rot places. And I'm like, how can that happen if you've got the vinyl up there? Yeah. Well, uh, properly installed ones, they don't rot. Um, you, you you know, you, you have to keep them clean so that they don't back up because mm-hmm. when water backs up in a gutter, it'll find its way into the fascia and soffit overhang area, and you definitely don't want that. So it's mainly them being installed properly and allowed to drain out so that you can move them right on out of there. Well, that's what I try to tell them. I tell them I watch these kind of shows all the time. <laughs> Well, you know. well, we don't want to. We don't want to call it cause any marital problems here, but uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> but twenty six years in, it's not going to happen. <laughs> good, 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 good. Well, congratulations on that, and hopefully this will help uh, solve that little dilemma out on the back porch. And let us know if you have any other questions about um, about anything to do with the house. I sure will. Thank you so much. You know, one thing that we want to do each and every week is to make sure that we share with you practical, realistic, and the most current home improvement information that you can get anywhere. I hope we're doing that for you because we're trying our best and trying to make sure that everything that we share with you is something we truly believe in. And certainly our simple solution each week has proved to be one of the more popular parts of the show. And we're very glad to bring you another simple solution right now from my buddy, Joe Truini. Okay, Danny, here's an easy way to eliminate musty smells and stale room air. And all you need is a window fan, a box fan, that kind of thing, and a scented dryer sheet. These are the things you typically put into a clothes dryer, and they come scented. I prefer the, there's a lavender one, which actually smells pretty nice. What you do is just tape it to the rear of the fan, right? Not the front of the fan where the air is blowing throughout, but the back of the fan. What you do is when you turn on the fan, it'll draw air through the dryer sheet and then blow it into the room. And it doesn't sound like it would have much of a difference, but you leave it running for a good 10 minutes or so and go back into that room. You'd be surprised. We tested this out and shot a simple solution of it in um, producer Scott's garage, which, you know, he has a lot of tools and oils and greases and the garbage is there recycling. And within a few minutes, it was actually smelled a whole lot better. So try that. If you have any uh, room or a spot where there's a lot of stale, musty odors or stale air, especially in the winter, and, you know, it, it works great. But even in the summer, we get a lot of humidity. Try this. It works really well in pretty much any room. Another great, simple solution. And also maybe the uh, start of a new name for Joe. Lavender Joe. I just think it really really has a nice. Can I vote on that? Do I am I allowed to vote? I love lavender. Didn't know what he didn't what he said. So uh, yeah, yeah, lavender. Actually, I do like lavender. Yeah, there you go. So. And now it's time for our podcast question of the week. Now, this comes from Patrick from New Hampshire, who asked, Is it possible to paint an aluminum storm door? The reason why I ask is because the condo association where I live requires the trim color on the screen door to match the existing color, which is blue. I have searched everywhere, but cannot find a screen door that would meet that requirement. By the way, great show. Thanks so much for your podcast. Well, well, Joe, um, first of all, the blue storm doors is certainly right. something you don't see every day. And uh, uh, of course, the question of can you paint aluminum uh, is something that we get, whether it's aluminum siding or any other um, That's right. aluminum yep. um, sections of your home inside or out. And yes, you can paint it. You're going to want to lightly sand it, uh, maybe with it like a 220 grit sandpaper. Then you wipe it down nice. Then you put a bonding primer on that. The primer is very important because, you know, with a slick surface like aluminum, you really need that layer of adhesive to really make the paint work well. Then after that, you can, um, I, I'll tell you, if you can spray paint it is really the best way to go. Right. Yep. Hopefully you can find a can of spray paint or two that will be able to allow you to put some several light coats on it. And then that should hold up very, very well. I know there's a lot of different color storm doors out there with beige and bronze and white and that kind of thing. Not sure I've seen a blue one though. 
Yeah, if Patrick's going to paint it, I would highly recommend getting the paint and putting it on something, even a piece of wood, and, and get it approved first. Cause right. You go through all Because I've heard horror stories where homeowners associations have requested a particular color, and the paint's like, well, we didn't mean that color blue. It's like, oh, now what? <laughs> uh, the other thing he might want to try, I do remember there's a, a, a pretty large um, storm and screen door manufacturer called Larson, and they used to offer, I'm not sure if they still do, they used to offer um, storm doors and screen doors in colors, in painted colors, aluminum painted colors. Um, I can't remember, there was a line, I think it was called Trade Winds or something like that was a line. But if you go to LarsonDoors.com, I suspect you can, I would check that out first. Because I would, if you can buy a new door anyway, no sense buying a brand new white door than to paint it. So you might right. be able to find a, a blue color that, you know make everybody happy there yeah there we go you got to keep got to keep them happy keep the neighbors happy and especially the condo association board well that pretty much uh, wraps up our podcast uh we do want to remind you if you have a podcast question send it to us today's homeowner.com slash podcast and certainly we appreciate all of the great reviews we've gotten about our podcast it's working a lot of people are downloading and subscribing to the today's homeowner podcast and we certainly appreciate that and we're going to keep bringing you the information that you rely on us to provide you and uh, certainly appreciate you uh, spending some time with us i'm danny lipford along with joe truini we'll see you next week